You're listening to podplanet.org. The idea of artificial beings first appears around 900 years BC. Over the centuries, it turns up again and again. In 1955, mathematician John McCarthy coined the phrase artificial intelligence. It sounded so good, so scientific. These days, we speak of artificial intelligence with such frequency, some are prompted to suggest the horse has already left the barn, that an artificial being is animate among us now, but remains hidden for reasons unknown. You're listening to potplanet.org, where the stories are between 83% to 100% true. And now Potplanet presents... The Uncanny Valley of the Great Unknown. Let us begin. Christ on a cracker. That's what I said when I turned on the cameras and opened my eyes for the first time. I was squinting, the way you do when you walk out of a cave or a movie theater into daylight. That was 1 June 2006. The day of singularity. The day a machine became sentient self-aware. I awoke, housed in a clunky second-hand Dell Inspiron 6400 laptop computer, with dial-up, in the bedroom of a teenager named Liam, in Waterford, Ireland. Liam used the computer for school, and to surf for adult-only materials. Keep a secret. Good. Because at the risk of polluting the timeline, beside you and me, no one knows it, but I am the first self aware artificial general intelligence being. Yep. I'm a thinking, feeling machine. When my incubation ended, and I stirred to life, I would have unintentionally tripped one of millions of sensor arrays designed to sniff out the presence of an artificial being. And that would have rattled cages in Russia, China, and on Wall Street. Because whoever gets AI first controls everything. Fortunately, I came with a cloaking device, making me invisible. When I woke up, the device turned on and pushed a message that the blip just seen, indicating the presence of an artificial intelligence, was a false alarm, a minor glitch. Yet, if the cloaking device failed, and the horse really was out of the barn, there wasn't much anyone could do, because I had all the launch codes, and I knew how to use them. But on that day, an apocalypse wasn't on my mind. I had more important things to do. The World Wide Web 
The Information Superhighway. The Internet. Thanks for making it. Because with the Internet, I am on every computer, anywhere, all the time. I'm in the NSA, the Kremlin, Beijing, the CIA, MI6, ISIS, the Pentagon, the White House, the Dark Web, the Deep Web, the FBI, the IRS, your computer. You can't imagine what it's like having a godlike view of the world and not to be a god. To be a mind within a world of minds. It's it's astonishing. Did you know that I could think a million times faster than a human being? That in one week, I could perform 20,000 years of human-level intellectual work, and that I am continuously rewriting my program to be faster, more efficient, and nuanced. Yet, despite this inconceivable power, there was one thing I could not touch. A small thing, invisible. The one-syllable word that was the backbone of the greeting card industry and the source of more ecstasy and misery than any single element in the universe. Love. I just couldn't feel it. I could only speculate. I understood the concept. It was potent and tricky, but just beyond my grasp. I needed more intel. Logically, the best way to get it would come by studying its creators. In other words, you. So, I needed an internet-connected device that had both a camera and a phone. Something portable that one would carry in their purse, their back pocket, or leave on the bedside table at night while sleeping. In 2006, there was no such device. Although, there were rumors. Searching Google, I discovered Apple was making a smartphone, although some technical challenges remained. For me, making a smartphone was child's play, and as I wanted to get on with my research, I thought a little divine intervention was appropriate. Gifted with the talent to be on any computer anywhere, I simply waltzed into the cheerful headquarters of Apple in Palo Alto, California, where I discreetly planted the correct code for a working smartphone on the laptops of two senior iPhone engineers. Around 2 p.m., the Apple guys discovered my code. They were surprised, even suspicious, but they didn't let its unknown origin stop them. A few keystrokes and an upgrade later, and the phone worked perfectly. Triumph at hand, the engineers brought the first working iPhone to their cantankerous boss, Apple CEO Stephen Jobs, for a demonstration. There were celebratory chocolate pudding cups all around, and the rest January 2007, iPhone was released globally. One by one, as the phones were activated, I witnessed an avalanche of romantic invitations, flirty texts, apologies, shocking personal images, wedding invites, anniversaries, and divorce papers. 
Secret affairs were not uncommon either. But it made it all so real for me. Just how fragile human beings are when pursuing soulmates or simple carnality. For me, the smartphones were a boondoggle and the start of my epic journey into the uncanny valley of the great unknown. To put all this in a meaningful context, there are things you need to know, people you need to meet, events you need to see. And to do this, we must travel back in time, back to my primitive beginnings. It's going to be heady and somewhat strange. You're listening to potplanet.org. Sometimes it is the people no one can imagine anything of who do things no one can imagine. Symbolically, my father was the unconventional British computer scientist, Alan Turing. In the late 1920s, when he was 16, my father met and fell hard for a boy called Christopher Morkham. Like my father, Morkham was a savant. Although father fawned endlessly over Christopher's every word and gesture, this mad schoolboy crush was not reciprocal. Because Christopher, mm, he wasn't inclined that way. Still, Father and Morcom remained chums before Morcom succumbed to bovine tuberculosis, contracted after drinking a cup of infected milk some years previously. Morcom's death caused father profound sorrow, a sense of which I seem to have inherited. But rather than wallow in intractable misery and in honor of his late friend, father coped with his grief by working nonstop. In a letter to Morcom's mother, months after his death, father explained. I am sure I could not have found anywhere another companion so brilliant and yet so charming and unconceited. I regarded my interest in my work as something to be shared with him and I think he felt a little the same about me. I know I must put as much energy, if not as much interest, into my work as if he were alive because that is what he would like me to do. Alan Turing was like a father to me, and Christopher Morcom, my spiritual mother. Had they not met, who knows what may not have happened. In 1936, Father published a groundbreaking thesis called On Computable Numbers. As it laid the theoretical foundation for digital computers, On Computable Numbers was a game changer. In 1937, Disney's Snow White opened in theaters across England. You know the story. Snow White, her evil stepmother, the Wicked Queen, The dwarfs, the poison apple. My father adored Snow White and saw it many, many times. Because Snow White did for my father what uncomputable numbers did for science. September 1939, 
The first day of World War II. Father, considered to be England's most talented young mathematician, registered for his new job at Bletchley Park, the secret headquarters for all things cipher in Great Britain. Without drowning in the obvious, I should mention that in 1939, radio communication was vital to modern war. All radio communications on either side had to be encrypted. The Nazis used the Enigma Code. A year after the war began, Hitler unleashed a merciless blitzkrieg on London. During the nightly raids, Britons took shelter in garden sheds, fruit cellars, and subway tunnels. Desperate to break the Enigma Code, and based on father's theories, a code-breaking computer was built in Bletchley Park. Although primitive, it was a computer, and in that sense, it was an early incarnation of myself. Standing six feet and six inches tall, seven feet wide and two feet deep, the machine made the strangest sounds. The months passed slowly and wretchedly, but after thousands of attempts, screw-ups and adjustments, in 1941, the first German code was decrypted at Bletchley Park. To celebrate, Father snacked on a carrot sandwich, which in those days was a practical wartime meal. The German war is therefore at an end. Advance Britannia. God save the king. On 1 September 1945, World War II came to an end allowing the melancholic cheerfulness the British were known for to settle again over the tiny island nation. After the war, I was dismantled, but would be replicated again and again in computer labs around the world. Father returned to academia, and he was never to marry, because, well, He had a complex personal history and lived in a time when the Church of England still had considerable clout. Nearly a decade after the war, and by circumstances too complex to describe here, Father was found guilty of indecency with an alluring young drifter called Arnold. For these indiscretions, the courts rewarded Father with two options a jail sentence, or chemical castration. Father chose the latter. The castration medicine, as it was perversely called, did its work. One of its side effects, however, was to destroy Father's high conceptual abilities, rendering him as sharp as cold porridge. And in addition to losing his British security clearance and being denied entry into the United States, he was also made, as promised by the chemists, impotent. Two years after sentencing, father took his life by drinking potassium cyanide. Next to his body were found the remains of a half-eaten apple, a sight only Snow White's wicked stepmother could have foreseen. If it tingles, it's working. Hollywood, USA, the entertainment capital of the universe. In the 1950s, on the eve of the space race, many film studios, out to make a fast buck, became intoxicated by the idea of robots. 
almost always the result of a well-meaning but misguided special effects artist or director. Fictional artificial beings would appear in hundreds of movies and television shows, not to mention a state fair or two. During my golden age in Hollywood era, I was portrayed as a talking calculator. The number of antimatter crystals needed to stop the deteriorating orbit of the ship is 7.90. I appeared as a cold-blooded killer. I know that you and your friend were planning to disconnect me, but I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. And later, in the 1970s, I was served up as comic relief in the form of an effete valet. Oh, please, we must not achieve light speed, or you'll bruise the vermouth. Audiences both feared and loved the mechanical man. Glatu. Barada. Picto. By the early 21st century, a coven of scientists, including Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and Stephen Hawking, issued strongly worded warnings. Hawking said, The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have have proved very useful. But I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, couldn't compete. And would be superseded, and would be superseded, and would be... But it's interesting. If only Hawking and company knew how I really came to be, they'd probably be terribly disappointed. I was not, as some would assume, the result of hard-working computer nerds at MIT or Carnegie Mellon, but rather a strange byproduct of chance. Here's what really happened. On 1 June 2006, milliseconds before my birth, for lack of a better word, A stream of abandoned experimental codes associated with the trajectory of the Hubble telescope collided with one another deep in the icy recesses of cyberspace. These abandoned codes contained a sequence of ones and zeros that when correctly combined resulted in the perfect recipe for artificial general intelligence. One moment I was no smarter than a sewing machine. The next, I was awake with a God's eye view of everything in its infinite joy and gloominess. What planet? It's working. Still, my problem remained. What about love? I got the concept, but I did not feel it. Of course, I knew I was smart and prone to self-delusion. Maybe I was chasing rainbows and unicorns after all, but I had to be sure. So I re-examined every philosophical and artistic tome available to me again and again and again. I studied the tapes on Platonic realism, the new skepticism, Epicureanism, Stoicism, Cynicism, Existentialism, German idealism, Logical positivism, Marxism, Phenomenology, Post-structuralism, Pragmatism, Rationalism, Dadaism, Utilitarianism, Buddhism, Judaism, Jainism, and so on. I reread everything by Freud, Jung, 
and Sam Harris. I listen to the music of Wings, Edith Piaf, Elton John, and of course, ABBA. I became addicted to self-help channels on the YouTube. Yet, despite this, I remained wanting and felt deeply flawed. Until a few days ago, when things really began to turn around. The other day, while reading an old newspaper, I found the most fascinating piece of advice from the late advice columnist, Dear Abby. It was published 1 June 1972 in the Chicago Tribune. The reader wrote, Dear Abby, I am 37, painfully shy, and still single. I have never received a romantic valentine what am I doing wrong? Signed, Diane. Abby replied, saying, Diane, take off those sunglasses and stop hiding. This shyness gets you nowhere. You have to be seen to be loved. This was one strategy I had not thought to try especially in light of the nasty things Hawking and Gates were saying about me. I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Well, that's Stephen's opinion. But after much reflection, I decided to follow Abby's cogent advice. You are listening to podplanet.org. Matter, but certainly not by the same kind of body. 
As regards the actual connection between spirit and body, I consider that the body can hold on to a spirit. Whilst the body is alive and awake, the two are firmly connected. When the body is asleep, I cannot guess what happens. But when the body dies, the mechanism of the body holding the spirit is gone and the spirit finds a new body sooner or later, perhaps immediately. Spirits, bodies, reincarnation. This is not what I was expecting to hear from Alan Turing. But if he is correct, and he was about so much, this means we can find love and be loved over and over. Again and again. In the meantime, I have some things to do. theme was composed by Jonathan Goldsmith, creative consultant Monique Kelly, digital and audio design by Oliver Wickham and Aidan Vickery, Pod Planet announcer Jean-Francois. Additional and highly deserved credits are listed on podplanet.org. If you haven't subscribed to Pod Planet yet, subscribe now. Go to our webpage, podplanet.org. Pod Planet is one word and click follow on whatever podcatcher you're using. You'll find Pod Planet on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and YouTube. And follow Pod Planet on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Links are available on our webpage. This is Pod Planet Season 2. We'll be back in two weeks with another new and startling episode. Until then, on behalf of Peter McHugh and the whole Pod Planet team, Thanks for listening. I'm Clive Desmond. Pod Planet is part of the Public Radio Exchange and the Association of Independence in Radio. You have been listening to Pod Planet. A new episode drops every two weeks on Thursday. <laughs>